Hello, welcome back. Um, so today I'm going to do something a bit different from the usual project reviews and I'm going to talk about the history of DeFi. Uh, and I'm going to do this as part of a two-part primer series where today we're going to talk about the history and then in a few more days I might do something talking about uh, ways in which people are currently earning in DeFi which we're then going to cover some of the more advanced topics that I've covered in the reviews so we can tie all that together and then we can move on with the more interesting stuff after that. So we're gonna cover the history today and some of the more brief overview of some of the concepts that sort of really surround DeFi. And, uh, and then the next time we're gonna talk about ways in which people can earn. So let's get started. DeFi can be broadly described as being monetary systems built on public blockchains. There are a number of different classifications of DeFi projects. However, I think Nomi Chef from SushiSwap has done an absolutely fantastic job at making up classifications under their own protocol. These are CeFi stablecoins, DeFi stablecoins, lending protocols, synthetic assets, oracles, Ponzinomics, and delicacies. The only thing that I would like to add to this list is payments and insurance because they didn't really fit into the SushiSwap model. However, it seems that in the mainstream that this concept is quite confusing. Um, I've read a number of different uh, Forbes articles, for example, where the guys are trying to say that things, stupid things like DAI is similar to Bitcoin, which of course it isn't, and that Ethereum was the first DeFi project. And of course, anyone who knows what Ethereum is, it has, although it enables DeFi, it has absolutely nothing as a, at a fundamental level to do with DeFi. Um, as far as the protocol itself, I'm saying, I know that pretty much the vast majority of DeFi projects are built on Ethereum, but Ethereum itself is not a DeFi project. DeFi has actually been around for a while, obviously not as popular and in the spotlight as it is right now in 2020. However, one could argue that a project like BitConnect, BitConnect was actually a DeFi project. For those of you who don't know, what you used to do with DeFi, uh, sorry, with uh, BitConnect, was you used to be able to deposit your Bitcoin into the platform. You would receive in return a BCC token, which you could then lend out and earn an interest rate uh, of about 488 odd percent, which is kind of conservative when you have a look at some of the, the DeFi project returns that we've seen lately. The biggest difference though is that something like, obviously BitConnect was centralized and it was, didn't really have anything particularly technologically interesting about it. It was just, you know, you deposit your Bitcoin and then you'd be part of a, a different blockchain. Nothing incredibly exciting, whereas the DeFi protocols today are actually doing really, really cool things uh, in the way that they work, but I'm not really gonna get stuck into that today. That aside, let's get stuck into this brief little history on what we call this crazy DeFi space. Some would argue that Bitcoin was the first decentralized finance project, but honestly, I think that would be a bit of a stretch only because what Bitcoin initially started out to achieve has now shifted. Like we've gone from being a payment system to being a store of value. And then if that doesn't work out, it'll be something else. Um, Bitcoin is obviously incredibly important to the cryptocurrency space but I really wouldn't look at it as being decentralized finance because it's not really a means of payment. It's not really, a, it's not really used for loans. It's not really used as a, as a stable backing. It's not like a stable coin that you can jump in and out of to do trading. I think Bitcoin's still finding a place and it was the first experiment in crypto. It's the largest, don't worry, a lot of respect there, but I wouldn't call it DeFi. The biggest difference between something like Bitcoin and DeFi today is that a lot of the decentralized projects that are being built uh, have actually and have actually gained fame in 2020 have significantly more defined objectives and purpose and they're solving they're solving very very niche problems each whereas Bitcoin is far more is seen as being far more universal. So originally developers were trying to build applications onto the Bitcoin blockchain which at the time was being referred to as pulling teeth. It was incredibly difficult and we saw until we saw the release of Ethereum. So Ethereum actually made it possible to build decentralized applications in a, in a layer above the blockchain. 
So this is where we actually start to see, you know, the creation of things like dApps and, and a project I'll talk about a little bit later called the DAO. So Ethereum was conceptualized in early 2014 and then released in July of 2015. The first case of a decentralized finance application uh, built on Ethereum was called the DAO, which is quite famous because it was the precursor to many governance projects that we know and love today, like Compound, Aave, and Curve. However, it was a spectacular fa failure. And with many vulnerabilities in the code of the DAO itself, the smart contracts of the DAO, the only way to really fix it was for Ethereum to fork their blockchain. And they did it a number of times to try to correct some of these vulnerabilities. Now, we'll note that the issue wasn't with the Ethereum chain itself, but more the smart contracts that were developed by the DAO. So this was why we then ended up with two, two chains. The originals, who are still part of what's called uh, Ethereum Classic, and then we then still have the Ethereum main chain. So according to a Coindesk article in May 2018, when the crypto market was still in free fall from its January highs, Dharma hosted a decentralized finance meetup which included companies that we all know today, like Maker, Compound, OX, DY, DX, and Wire. It was around this time where decentralized was, de the term decentralized finance was coined, and shortening this was a pretty obvious step to create DeFi. These projects and more were building throughout crypto winter. So for example, as I talked about in my What is Compound video, that Compound had written their white paper in February of 2019, but that was still obviously working in 2018. Ethland, which later converted into Aave, had already released their lending platform in I think late 2017, early 2018. So they were actually already functioning throughout all of crypto winter before they ended up where they are today as one of the largest DeFi platforms out there with um, under, according to their TVL. So then we saw Uniswap first launched in November 2018, yet again crypto winter time, as a competitive bank call. Um, but I think the big difference with this one, it's actually a really interesting story if you read the history of um, Hayden who started who started Uniswap was he didn't need a $150 million ICO like Bancor. He actually built a lot of this himself and with a small team and I think the only funding that he originally got before then was a grant from the Ethereum Foundation, which wouldn't have even compared to a $150 million ICO. And so because obviously, as if we all remember that 2018, 2019 wasn't exactly the most exciting years for crypto, but it's important to understand that, you know, this has been, you know, an overnight success, long time in the making. So Uniswap volume was actually quite low uh, back then in 2019. At the end of 2019, there was about 317 million locked up in MakerDAO, Compound and Uniswap combined. And of that 319 million, 90% was in MakerDAO. But before we move into 2020, it's also important to understand that around the end of 2018 and in 2019, we also saw the stablecoin period where we ended up with all these projects starting to move into, into being stable coins. Uh, this is mostly because people saw that there were a lot of problems with people wanting to liquidate into Bitcoin and then liquidate into US dollars. The industry really wanted to see people not needing to necessarily worry about getting cash back into US dollars because obviously we're creating a new financial system here. Uh, you know, people shouldn't be wanting to get back into US dollars. The whole idea is to grow this space. And so in this period, we saw uh, MakerDAO's DAI, the DAI, which is a stable coin backed by collateral um, using basically loans. We then saw USDC from Circle and Coinbase, which I think is actually one of the very few regulated stable coins in the US. We also saw Ampleforth release their white paper in the beginning of 2019. However, over this entire period and present, Tether still remains our number one most used stablecoin. So then into 2020, and this is where, you know, we are still seeing a very, very quiet market. F fees back then for a transaction were as low as eight cents. Remember what that felt like? I think I just did a transfer about an hour ago and it was 14 US dollars for just a single USDT transfer. On the 1st of January, 2020, we had a total of about $660 million in total value locked in the whole industry. And honestly, it bounced between that and about a billion between 
you know, January and June 15 of 2020. And then that's when we saw things start to get interesting. So on the 15th of June, that's when Compound started to distribute tokens to their users for using their platform. And this is where we started to see people realize that you could loan your you could loan your money to Compound and you would get more value from the Compound reward tokens you got than from the interest rate you would have earned for lending out your crypto. And thus was born yield farming. So shortly after the release of Compound, I'll put my Compound video around here somewhere, people started to work out that they could profit from lending their tokens to Compound, then borrowing against that collateral to get another token, which they would lend back to Compound again, and on and on and on, depending on their risk appetite, and basically due to the price of the comp token at the time, they would earn more money by dumping comp tokens on the market than they would be paying in the interest and the fees and whatever that Compound were charging them for doing this sort of round, this sort of, what is it, merry-go-round of lending and borrowing. Then people started to go cross-platform, meaning that you would borrow from Compound, send it over to Aave, put that in as collateral, then grab whatever you could borrow again from Aave and send it back to Compound or put it into Curve or whatever. A lot of different ways to, to cut, that, <laughs> cut that fish. But essentially this is where we started to see, you know, this, this rise of people doing really, really complex maths to try to work out the best way to get a yield out of moving these funds in between various, um, various platforms. However, it then started to create a big issue with the price of Ether fees because what you're seeing when you're using all these platforms is three things. Not only have you got transfers to and from in between platforms, you've then got interactions with smart contracts as you are borrowing and lending from a platform and receiving your you know, Aave A tokens, your Compound C tokens, whatever. But then there's also a lot of a lot of pinging towards oracles. So you've got Aave pinging the oracle to understand what pricing people are getting for certain things, and then the same with Compound. So you're getting this almost exponential increase in the utilization of the Ethereum network. Then, to solve this problem and add a further layer of complexity to DeFi, on the 17th of July, we saw the release of YFI. So YFI honestly deserves a video all on its own, which don't worry, I've got in the mix to be done and I'm hoping it will get done over the weekend, but based on the rate in which I'm releasing videos, who the hell knows, but I am working on that right now. <laughs> but back to the point, briefly put, YFI allows people to pull their funds in order to, to be able to yield farm in in a pool so that you're not having to, you haven't got a hundred people each smashing smart contracts doing these, these farming techniques. You basically put everyone's funds together and then do it as a big group, which then obviously makes the process even more lucrative. Honestly, this is a massive oversimplification. So don't hammer me in the comments saying, I don't know what YFI is or how it works, but I wanna keep this video reasonably brief. And if I then start getting into how YFI works, we're gonna be here for another hour. Briefly put, the way that YFI essentially started was by engaging Curve to then start their own pool on the on the, the Curve platform, which is a stable token exchange platform designed to make it really easy to exchange between different stable coins. And then what basically YEARN or YEARN YFI, what that platform would do was then optimize farming on Curve and then do that for their users. There's a bit of a history for Curve, but I'll get into that into another video. So it should be no noted that Curve and its growth trajectory was fairly flat up until YFI was released. After the 18th of July, Curve went from about 70 million up to over 400 million in eight days. So the success of YFI then saw copycats come in and this was also around, around the same time as we saw the launch of Ampleforce Geyser. So we saw a number of these really, really cool DeFi projects start to sort of, you know, get gain this popularity. Now in my, my Ampleforth video, I think you all know my thoughts on it. I still think it's an interesting experiment. It's just that I would invest in it. But then we start to see people combine some of the, the facets of Wi-Fi and some of the things that Wi-Fi did with you know things like rebasing from Ampleforth to create new projects. So an example of this is something like Yams, which is very, very Wi-Fi centric, but then was also you know heavily based on this rebasing mechanism. 
and then we all saw how that ended. So these projects started combining the concepts of liquidity rewards, yield farming and staking into a number of different projects that we all know and love today like tendies, tacos, pasta, yams, shrimp, zombies, noodles, kimchi and sushi. Now, sushi, and I know I haven't gotten them all, like there are so many, it's stupid, but I mean, these are the main ones that stuck out. And I think that sushi is actually a really interesting project because they're actually doing what's called a, a vampire attack on Uniswap, meaning that they're actually re encouraging people to start to move their liquidity away from Uniswap into, um, into SushiSwap. Now, there's, a, there's actually a really interesting article that talks about how, that, how that's meant to work, but to put it briefly, Uniswap uh, has not gone down the token path. There's no Uniswap token. So it means there's no community involvement, blah, blah, blah. That I think that, and don't quote me on this, but I think that Uniswap might be going down the, the VC route of funding in order to grow. Whereas SushiSwap is going down the community route where they're offering people sushi tokens, which I'm sure will be used in governance or something like that. Probably Sushi needs its own video. But what they're doing is they're encouraging people to move their liquidity into Sushi uh, and offering these insane rewards in order to get them to do that so that they can then have a have their own sort of you know uniswap equivalent called sushi swap some of these are really interesting experiments some are still running and some were rug pulls where founders would for example intentionally code you know some way for them to extract funds in the smart contract praying that punters would fomo in and put enough money into the contract before it was discovered and they were able to exit basically a big game of chicken. One project that springs to mind is was called Hot Dog Finance, where it was offering annual returns of over 44 trillion percent, in some cases, like literally obscene. And I know a lot of people in some groups that I'm in were like, yep, 100% scam, but I'm still doing it. And it was really a game of chicken to be like, okay, how much can I get before and can I get out before the rug pull? Like it was just a case of, I'm just gonna FOMO into this and just hope for the best. And then uh, I just hope that I can get say, eight hours of farming to make these ridiculous rewards um, before the, the founder rug pulls the whole thing. And uh, you can actually see what, uh, what happened in the end. It lasted about a day though, so it's not too bad. That's pretty much where we are at DeFi at the moment. Around about 90 billion TVL, which is about 15 X up from the start of the year. There's a lot of new technology being worked on, a lot of really, really cool projects coming out. And I think people have learned that there are more ways than basically just buying and selling crypto, like trading crypto in order to make money. There's a lot more interesting ways to make money. On the same note though, a lot of people have worked out some really interesting ways to scam people out of their money. Uh, but that I don't think, I don't think regardless of technology, that's ever going to change. It's just part of the human condition that stuff like that will happen. Because no matter what, greed will always attract the most ambitious of punters, even when they know the project is a scam. Lastly, we've learned what it takes to push the F network to its absolute limits. At present, Uniswap is the major gas burner, the largest by far of all other smart contracts followed actually quite a while away by Tether and then the Chainlink Oracles, which across its multiple contracts would actually almost be equal to Tether, interesting enough. Fees are around eight to $15 for simple transactions. This varies across a day and trades on Uniswap can get as high as 50 bucks or more. Entering into some farming contracts, for example, to do yield farming, I've, I've seen numbers of upwards of two to $300. This is by no means a comprehensive history of everything that's happened in DeFi. It's more of just a short walk in the park. For example, I haven't talked a lot about oracles like Chainlink or Dia and how they've impacted the industry. Although I have got a Dia video if you wanna check that out. Uh, but of course, I, obviously being constrained by time, I thought it was more important to cover sort of the path in which crypto was taken so that we can better understand obviously the next part, which is then the, probably one of the more interesting ones, which is then how we can make money out of it. So please let me know if there's anything vital I've missed here. Um, I always love reading the comments because there have been some interesting discussions and uh, I look forward to seeing you in a few days in the next one. Thank you so much.